Hello, my name is John Milburn and I'm the unit coordinator for property development, which is Prop 13001 Central Queensland University. This is the two camera session for week six. And this week we're dealing with the issue of planning. So planning, of course, is of vital importance to property developers. And some of the key concepts for a property developers to consider relate to the manner in which councils in particular will zone properties and how property developers then go about implementing developments by accessing um, uh, the procedures including dealing with accessible development, um, code accessible or impact accessible development and um, working within the development assessment system generally. So in order to undertake a property development, the property developer will need to be aware of zoning issues, will need to be aware of uh, issues to deal with um, state government and councils, and um, some of the uh, issues to do with um, planning policies and regional plans and planning schemes generally. They can be permanent or they can be temporary planning um, schemes. So, very often at the outset, when considering the acquisition of land for development, the zoning is an issue that uh, needs to be overcome. And it may be that um, the applicant, property developer, needs to make an application for a development in spite of a conflict with the planning documentation. And that may require the property developer to consider applying to the Planning and Environment Court in the event of an unfavorable decision by the decision maker, the assessment authority, the assessment manager at first instance. So, um, but even then, if the um, approval is given, it may be that the property developer needs to consider challenging the conditions that were imposed on the basis that conditions must not be imposed unreasonably. So there are many issues that relate to property development within the context of planning. So planning involves consideration of planning policy, the associated legislation that goes with it, in Queensland, of course, the Planning Act 2016 is the key piece of legislation and um, it is important that property developers understand that the development assessment system integrates decision making for development approvals under that Act with decision making activities under other laws as well. It is important that property developers understand that there is an assessment manager who is generally someone from the council who considers the application and will often do so in conjunction with what are called concurrence agencies, which are agencies that have input into the decision-making process and essentially in many ways a right of veto. So the property developer may, as it were, be fighting on a number of fronts, um, even more so if submitters, objectors, become involved in the process. So what do property developers need to do and understand about planning scheme? Well, the first is consider the appropriate legislation. In Queensland, that's the Planning Act 2016. Also look at the um, regulations that go with it, the Planning Regulation 2017. At a federal level, consider the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act 1999, the EPBCA. The department has some excellent material, um, that's the Queensland Department, on its website and uh, have a look at the Moodle, the study guides, and you'll see some commentary in relation to Queensland's planning system and links to the material about the planning system. So you'll find some excellent online resources about the planning system. I urge you to consider that. Pause the video now go and look at the planning system and the manner in which it works. What you'll see is that there is an interactive uh, procedure where you can uh, input certain information and from that you can um, gauge the likely system, the, the flowcharts, which are developed as part of it. Now, <clears throat> even though I've mentioned Commonwealth Government and State Government, be aware that under the Statutory Instruments Act, Local planning instruments regulated by the local council, principally planning schemes, have force of law as statutory instruments. So 
the Planning Act prescribes in Section 8 that the following are state planning instruments, that is state planning policy, regional plans, and the Minister may make instruments that contain guidelines setting out matters. Uh, have a look at the Planning Act Section 17 in that regard. So property development comprises of a number of things, but primarily it's this the carrying out of building or engineering or mining or other operations in, on or over or under land or undertaking any material change of use in any buildings or other land. So there are, if you like, two categories, being physical operations and the other making material change of use to a current property plan. So have a look at Section 2 of the Planning Act, which defines development by way of activity or classification. And um, you'll see there, there's reference to carrying out building work, plumbing or drainage work, operational work, or reconfiguration of a lot, which is a subdivision, or making a material change of use of a premises. And within the context of development, be aware that there is um, code accessible development or impact accessible development, and that is directly relevant when it comes to consideration of the uh, basis upon which objectors, submitters, may appeal against proposed developments. In short, submitters may only appeal against a development decision that involves impact assessment. So when I talk about these issues, it's very um, hard to disassociate it with from case law. And the case law is primarily cases decided in the Planning and Environment Court, that's in the Queensland context. And in that court, uh, in those court decisions, you'll see a range of decisions that relate to developers appealing against a refusal, developers appealing against the imposition of what are said to be unreasonable conditions, and appeals made by submitters um, against the decision to approve a development or approve a development on certain conditions which are, according to the submitters, unreasonable or unsatisfactory. So when you read the Planning and Environment Court decisions, you'll see a range of those sorts of review matters, which are called merits reviews. And in amongst them, you'll also see issues to do with compliance. Uh, that is, the failure primarily of a developer to comply with conditions imposed as part of an approval for a development. So there's a range of things to consider there. <clears throat> but let's go back. Let's talk about the stages of development, a system, development assessment system and what's involved in that process. Again, the best thing that I can do is refer you to the Queensland planning system, which is on the website. You'll see the link on the website and consider the development assessment rules that apply which are all supported, of course, as part of the Planning Act processes. Speaking of the Planning Act, have a look at Chapter 3, Part 5, which deals with development approvals, and Division 1 deals with the effect of development approval. Have a look at Section 68 of the Planning Act. The Minister may make development assessment rules for development assessment processes, and Section 68 provides the authority to do so. And those development assessment rules are given effect through the planning regulation 2017. And as you might expect, these rules are also statutory instruments. So look at the planning regulation as well as the Act. Have a look at Section 284 of the Planning Act 2016. And do so in conjunction with Section 17 of the Acts Interpretation Act uh, 1954. That's the Queensland uh, Acts Interpretation Act which authorises the Minister to make planning um, regulations um, and uh, have a look also at the explanatory notes. Now, there are links in the study guides to all of these things, and I'd urge you to take some time to look at them. I mentioned that impact accessible development is a key concept. Have a look at Section 45 of the Planning Act, which defines what is an impact assessment. And you'll see that it says an impact assessment is an assessment that must be carried out against the assessment benchmarks in a categorising instrument 
for the development and having regard to any matters prescribed by regulation and may be carried out against or having regard to any other relevant matter other than the person's personal circumstances, financial or otherwise. Now that may seem like an awful lot of words and you wonder what it means. So the best way to understand the approval system in practice is to look at the online tools. You'll find them on the web page for Queensland's planning system. You can produce your own flowchart to match your development application. So have a look at the questions, answer the questions, and develop your own flowchart. In the study guide, you'll see that um, I've given you a sample of questions that you may need to consider. And then I've given you a sample of a flowchart that is generated automatically through the website as a result of answering those particular questions. As a property developer, you may wish to avail yourself of a preliminary approval process. Have a look at section 49 in that regard. And if there is problematic matters potentially uh, likely to surface as a result of a development application, obtaining preliminary approval um, arguably is an excellent way to proceed. In the study guide, I've referred to a couple of cases. A good example is the Mackay Conservation Group against Mackay City Council and East Point Mackay PDYLTD. It's a planning and environment court decision from 2005. His Honour Judge Robin QC in that case rejected an application to disallow an approval but strengthened existing conditions and then added a further seven. So what that emphasises is that in these cases where it's a merits review, the presiding judge in the PNE court has the opportunity to consider the matters um, afresh based on the information provided at the time. It's not a review of the decision made by the council, it's a fresh decision made on the information as provided to it at that time. It's a merits review and the idea is that the judge in that jurisdiction will make the correct and preferable decision uh, is um, the terminology used. So um, have a look at that and get an idea of how the preliminary approval process can work in conjunction with the approval process per se. Now I've been talking really about issues that relate to council approvals and regional council approvals where the um, assessment manager comes from the council. Contrast that to ministerial powers, uh, the minister in Queensland, pursuant to section 103 of the Planning Act, may call in an application if a development involves a state interest. So the process of calling in is ministerial power available to uh, essentially escalate the matter to a state level. And in those circumstances, the minister may uh, consider and assess and decide or reassess and redecide the application, at which case um, the process may have to restart. In the um, study guide, I've provided some examples of ministerial call ins. You'll see that there's um, a solar farm at Burdekinshire Council, there's the Cedar Woods development at Upper Kedron, and you'll see the call in notices um, are actually referred to. There's a link to the call in notices and you can see the decision notices as well. So that's a very interesting process and property developers may need to be aware of that if the property development they're, they're involved in reaches a certain level of um, expertise or complexity rather. Now I've talked about the assessment manager. The assessment manager is essentially the person responsible for deciding the application. That's it. In short, it's usually someone from the local or regional council, but there are referral agencies or concurrence agencies and have a look at section 54 of the Planning Act, which deals with the issue of referral agencies. So for example, a, um, uh, an assessment manager may decide to refer a matter to a referral agency, essentially for an expert opinion in relation to certain areas of expertise. Um, and the referral agency at that stage does form part of the process and has a right to um, agree or disagree or agree on conditions in relation to any application before it. Now bear in mind that when the decisions are being made, they must be made consistent with state planning policy and regional plans and local plans. 
And if they're not, um, there is an opportunity to argue that the decision is not consistent with the plans. Now, as a property developer, you may go either way. You may argue for something to be um, approved in accordance with the policies, or you may argue that um, the, uh, despite the conflict with planning policies, that there should be a, um, an approval or an approval on certain conditions. So have a look at section um, 25 of the Planning Act, which deals with the hierarchy of state planning policies and regional plans. In the study guide, I've given you a link how to access the state planning policy. And have a look at section 38 of the Planning Act when considering the issue of regional plans. Also look at section 36. And um, what you'll see is that the state planning policy set out the regulatory framework and um, they become the overarching uh, guide, if you like, for the policy documentation. Now, when we filter down to the local level, have a look at section 77 of the Planning Act, which deals with local planning instruments. Uh, that can be a planning scheme. And the local government must ensure that each of its local planning instruments is consistent with standard planning scheme policies. Have a look at section 55 of the Planning Act. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is that as a property developer, you may argue that certain um, instruments are invalid, unlawful, because they're not consistent with standard planning scheme provisions, for example. Have a look at sections 79 and 83 of the Planning Act, which deals with the planning scheme being an instrument that advances the purposes of the Planning Act by providing an integrated planning policy for local gaining local government planning scheme areas. And there are certain things that a local government planning scheme must include and that it must generally reflect the standard planning scheme provisions, identify strategic outcomes, include measures that facilitate the achieved strategic outcomes and coordinate and integrate matters in a certain manner. Now, of course, I've been talking about permanent, if you like, um, planning instruments, but it is possible for local planning instruments to be included as well. Now, many of the cases that we see relate to arguments about whether it may be justifiable to approve a development in spite of a conflict with a planning scheme. Have a look at um, Whiteman against the Gold Coast City Council, uh, for example, uh, for a good statement of the law in that regard. And um, you'll see some other cases that I've referred to that provide a good outline of the considerations that a court must undertake. And of course, when I say that the court must undertake these considerations, that equally applies to the assessment manager in considering the application at first instance. Very often, if an approval is granted, it's made subject to conditions. And the conditions that are imposed by an assessment manager or a court we're stepping into the shoes of the assessment manager, must be reasonable. In other words, the conditions must not make an unreasonable imposition on a property developer. It's not an opportunity for local authorities to say, well, we'll approve, but let's treat it as a money grab and we'll get the developer to spend all sorts of money on all sorts of projects and conditions. It's not like that. The conditions must be reasonable. Have a look at sections 65 to 67 of the Planning Act. Those are provisions that govern the imposition of conditions in a development approval by restating in part the case law and adding new permissible types of um, developments uh, conditions such as environmental offsets. Have a look also at section 65 of the Planning Act, which really provides the key as to what conditions must be, they must be relevant to, but not an unreasonable imposition on the development or use of premises as a consequence of the development or must be reasonably required in relation to the development or use of the premises as a consequence of the development. Now, all of this is an expanded version of what we call the Wensbury Corporation Administrative Law Principle. It comes from a 1948 case in England. Um, basically, it said in that case that if a local authority decision is so unreasonable, that is, it's lacking some rational, justifiable basis, that no so sensible local authority could devise it, 
then a court can set it aside. That is, the court can invalidate the condition. So unsurprisingly, many of the cases that we see in the Planning and Environment Court relate to the extent to which the council can justify the conditions that it seeks to impose as part of an approval for a development. Have a look at Ward against Tablelands Regional Council 2014. You'll see a decision of Judge Everson uh, rejecting contentions by the council and some submitters in favour of the contentions of the owners of a subject site. It was to do with a rotational outdoor piggery development proposal. So as a property developer, I would have thought that you'd want to read these cases and particularly in conjunction with your lawyers, have some arguments ready to advance when you're at the negotiation table with the assessment manager in trying to uh, obtain an approval on favourable terms. Now, it may be that um, uh, there is a challenge to the lawfulness of a consent and have a look at Connolly against Brisbane City Council and Kendrew Town Plumbing, 2015. In that case, a concerned citizen, Mr Connolly, challenged the validity of an owner's consent to the making of a de development application. He sued the council and he sued the developer. Uh, it was all to do with certain work at the Sandgate Aquatic Centre and um, there was an argument about the lawfulness of what was proposed and the consent that was made. So from a property developer's perspective, be mindful of that um, because you may be attacked from not only the council, but also others concerned citizens in that type of role. Now, have a look at uh, section, so have a look at um, Whit Whitmac Industrial against Toowoomba Regional Council, 2015. Again, it's referred to in your study guide. And in that case, Judge Moore's own QC considered an original application where the applicant developer sought declaratory and consequential relief under the former legislation, the Sustainable Planning Act, uh, in relation to its case. So that was all to do with a code accessible development and um, there was a, a development permit for material change of use of a service station. And um, uh, it, it was an argument about the extent to which the food and drink outlet associated with the service station can fit within the um, regulatory regime in that case. Okay, so I know that's been a very quick overview of the provisions that relate to planning. The key issues are be aware of the legislation, be aware of the role of the players involved in the process, be aware that other players through, um, uh, you know, can be brought in to uh, make decisions um, as decision makers, be aware of where you need to go to argue for or against certain conditions and approvals and be aware of the case law and procedures. Have a look at the flow charts that you'll see sourced on the website for the um, uh, department. Thank you very much for listening. All the best.